Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Association of Indian Research Scholars fourth E lecture. We are back once again with a topic that has the potential to become the epicenter of a larger global conflict in future. We are glad that you all have joined us for an in-depth analysis and insights by Professor Muhammad Mozam Ali on Nagorno-Karabakh history and implications. Before we begin, let me introduce myself. I am Ariba Asanat Mozam, Senior Research Scholar, Department of Political Science at the University of Hyderabad. Before we flag off today's lecture, I would like to request one of our executive members from Shillong, Evangeline Nonclaw, PhD research scholar, Department of English at the University of Hyderabad to walk us through the inception of Association of Indian Research Scholars, or as we like to call it, AIS. Over to you, Yuan. Thank you, Ariba. I'd like to read the introduction of AIS. Association of Indian Research Scholars, also known as AIS, is the brainchild of Ariba Asana, the president of this association. It was created to bring together like-minded, intellectually inclined, and enthusiastic research scholars of our generation, and to collectively increase our knowledge base while also interacting with the best minds in the world. To this end, we have gathered, we have garnered the support of some of the best in their field, including Professor Mohammed Muazzam Ali, Professor and former, former HOD, Department of Political Science, University of Hyderabad. Professor Zoya Hassan, Professor Emerita, Center for Political Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Professor Alfredo Toro Hardy, retired Venezuelan diplomat, scholar, professor, and public intellectual. Dr. Aparna Devare, uh, Assistant Professor at the University of Hyderabad. Professor Rajan Harshe, Professor of Political Science and the former Vice Chancellor of Allahabad Central University, and many scholars from across the world, including Nuno Rodriguez, Director Quixote Global from Madrid, Spain, Paul Simonski from Space Strategy Center, Carnegie Mellon University, New Mexico, USA. The aim of an association like AIRS is not, to not only provide a platform for young scholars to connect with experts, but also to have intellectually stimulating and interactive sessions with them. In order to make this happen, we aim to host webinars, e-lectures, seminars, talks, book discussions, and distinguished lectures. In the future, we also intend to expand towards conferences, seminars, symposiums, and book discussion panels. Through these mediums, AIRS intends to promote a seamless and harmonious interaction and engagement between the social sciences and humanities communities in the country. It also aspires to bring together people to hold discussions, debates, and conversations on theory, research methodology, research ethics, research practices, and methods to expand the research community and to bring everyone within one ambit. The future of AIRS holds dynamic experiences. We intend to bring the Indian community closer to the international community, not only through lectures and seminars, but also through publications. AIRS intends to focus on the most relevant issues in the world and the various pressing scenarios on the national and international scene. Following AIRS will help you stay on the top of not only current affairs, and get an in-depth analysis of burning topics, but it was, will also give you the opportunity to expand your knowledge base through the diversity of our events. You can follow AIRS on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, WhatsApp, Telegram. You can also follow our site, airs.org.in. Thank you, and over to you, Ariba. Ariba, you're muted. Am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, you're audible. Okay. 
So as I was saying, Dr. Muhammad Mazum Ali, former HOD and professor of political science at the University of Hyderabad has over 90 published research articles and two books to his credit. His first book, The Collapse of the Soviet Union, The Nationality Causes, was published in 2004, followed by his editorial work, The Threat Perception in a Globalizing World, with special reference to India in 2013. He did his MPhil and PhD from the Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. He studied in Moscow for over two years. He is fluent in Russian, apart from English, and his native tongue, Urdu. He has delivered lectures across the world at London, Brussels, East and West Berlin, Warsaw, Helsinki, Vienna, Stockholm, to name a few. He was selected by UGC again in 1992 to give a lecture in Moscow at the Institute of State and Law and the Institute of Oriental Studies. He was invited under Leanne Palm Scholarship Program to visit Uppsala University, Sweden. He was sponsored by Maison de Sciences de la Homme to visit Paris. He attended the Eurasian Conference in Antalya, Turkey. And he has also appeared in many radio and TV interviews and lectures. Sir, with this, I would now like to invite our eminent speaker to share with us his astute insights on the topic. Over to you, Professor Mohammed Mazamali. Yeah, you can speak now. Oh, yes. Thank you very much, Ariba, for your kind words. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you all. Uh, the subject chosen for this uh, morning discussion is uh, of topical importance, and I was looking forward to speak on it uh, because I was looking forward to very searching questions so that while answering them, I would clarify myself and also improve my article, which I already have written, but now revising. I mean, the process of revising it. And I thought an input from the audience like you, I hope that most of you are research scholars and therefore quite familiar with the goings on in the world right now, and you would ask questions. I hope that would be mutually beneficial uh, to us. Today, the two countries involved primarily are Armenia and Azerbaijan. Armenia got its independence on 24th August uh, 1990 and Azerbaijan in 1991. These countries have been uh, historically in conflict. I'll come to the reasons why they are in conflict uh, in a minute. But I should say that if you look at the map, the location, South Russia. To the Southeast, you have these two countries. And if you go a little West, you have uh, Georgia and followed by the Caucasian region. The whole Caucasian region is still volatile. We have Chechens, we have Dagestanis, we have North and South Ossetians, uh, all of them uneasy with each other. Russia had fought two wars in Caucasia against the Chechens after second war Putin came to power on the wave of nationalism that it arose. Now, coming back to Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, so much has been written in the national and international press that I thought I should start on a personal note. I was friends with Azerbaijanis and Armenians, and they used to come to my room in Moscow and sit and chat over or cups of Indian tea, which was a rarity at the time. And uh, they made no bones about the fact that they don't get along very well outside, uh, in the sense that there is some 
uneasiness with them and sometimes hostility for historical reasons. But with, with me, all of them were okay and then we used to converse, chat and so on. Uh, so second point of interest was that my interest in Nagorno-Karabakh was a roast. Uh, I didn't know much about the area because I was specializing on Russian constitutional development. My friend, Arshak, uh, involved me in this because there was going to be a day to commemorate the 1.5 million Armenians who were thrown into Mount Ararat. And uh, they mostly perished, most of them perished. Armenians commemorated that day by going to church and playing music and praying and so on. So when this day came, they invited me, so I went along with them to their church. Uh, the beautiful Armenian church music still uh, you know, runs in my ears and uh, it was quite impressive. But what exactly happened and the details of which are roughly something was said about the Ararat mountains. In fact, on Ararat mountain, I remember a joke. You see, Turkey and Armenia had not got along very well. Uh, Turkey has Ararat mountains. And uh, Armenians figure Ararat mountains in their flag. So the Turkey is quite cross with that. They, they ask, how can you show Ararat Mountains is not part of your country uh, on your flag? So it doesn't belong to you. So the Armenian replied that you have uh, the, the map of moon on your national flag. Do you own the moon or uh, like moon is part of you or what? Why do you have it? So there were thus interactions between them like that. And uh, that tragic incident, which Armenians call massacre, and Turkey says there was no massacre. It was a wartime, and in wartime casualties do take place, and that's what it happened. It happened. So, uh, the third point of interest for me was, uh, some years ago, the ambassador of Armenia to India wrote a PhD thesis which came to me for evaluation. I evaluated, of course, we interviewed him and all. And uh, subsequently, I kept in touch with him. Uh, uh, we exchanged emails and so on. I tried to keep up to date. Uh, I tried to keep up to date through uh, emails with him. Uh, as I said, if you go beyond uh, this area, the background, you have the whole of Caucasus in, in turmoil of one kind or the other. Caucasus was once again in news recently when a Caucasian beheaded the French teacher uh, for showing a very uh, blasphemous, I don't know, what is the other appropriate word, blasphemous uh, language for Prophet Muhammad. The, the man is shot, was shot dead right there. Once again, Caucasus was in, in the news. You see, they, they both have Soviet background. Armenia and Azerbaijan were both the Soviet republics in the USSR. Gaidar Aliyev was the president of Armenia when I was there. And then now the uh, Armenian prime minister they have is Nikol Pashinyan. They have these, these names, Pashinyan. I know the latest news is that the ministers from Armenia and Azerbaijan 
have met Putin, he called them. Before that, they had met Pompeo to find a solution, but nothing came, nothing came out of it. So, uh, Now, when I came back to India, I retained interest. I came back in 1986 and I retained interest in the Nagorno-Karabakh question. So I went to Turkic Embassy. They gave me two books and many booklets. And I went to USSR Embassy. They gave me some material. I, I sat down and wrote an article in 2010. From 2010 to 20, I did not publish all that was based on primary sources. I consulted the Turkic newspaper, Today's Zaman, and Armenian newspapers and Azerbaijani newspapers and wrote that piece. Now, after this seminar I, and, and discussion and the input that it constitutes, I want to improve that article and publish it. So all of it's very late, but nonetheless, uh, I'll, I'll do that. Now, the starting point was an agreement between Armenia and Turkey after many years to relax their relations, to bring about a thaw in their relations. And an agreement to that effect was signed in 2009. And that held up possibilities of Armenia. Armenia, uh, by the way, is a landlord country, as you know. And uh, Azer Azerbaijan has Caspian Sea, but Caspian Sea also is landlocked. But Azerbaijan is very rich in oil, as you all know. Baku is one of the centers of uh, where pipelines are there for shifting oil and natural gas to Europe. And it passes near uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. So therefore, the world was alarmed when this conflict began again. It's not for the first time that they, they have come into conflict. There is a history to it. And this time, when the pipeline was threatened, the world was alarmed. Uh, Russia took diplomatic activity. They were both asked to negotiate, settle down and come to the table from Pope uh, to um, Russia, uh, Iran, United Nations, and so all of them prodded them to come to uh, talk to table and then settle out the issue. So the importance of this is that oil can be badly affected if this war continues. And this war has the potential of involving all the surrounding countries. It could be something like a first world war situation, whereas assassination of uh, uh, a king led to a first world war. Of course, the, at that time, there were many other funny things in the sense, as the AGT pillar points out, if once you mobilized your armies, you could not demobilize. So once Russian armies on the, were on the march, they could not demobilize, and as a response, the Western European countries just responded. Anyway, this time, it may not happen that way, but it will happen in a different way. But all the same, the potential remains. And that potential arises out of the relations between Turkey and Armenia, Armenia and Azerbaijan. And Iran is also involved. Iran has said that if it spilled over to Iran, they would react. Actually, Armenian diaspora also is one of the very important factors. Armenians are quite, uh, uh, quite uh, dynamic people. Actually, they used to joke, saying that the Jews did not come to Armenia because they thought Armenians are self-sufficient. So uh, Armenia uh, has diaspora of uh, quite a substantial figure. 
like about a million Armenians live in Iran, a million live in Turkey. 17,000 live illegally in Turkey. And uh, in fact, the reach has been quite wide. The city from where I'm speaking, Hyderabad, has a central road called Abits. And that name came from Abidjan, who was an Armenian who came to Hyderabad to sell diamonds and gold to aristocracy in Hyderabad. He somehow fell foul with them and was asked to asked not to come. So he opened a medical shop and that road, central road of Hyderabad is known as uh, Abid, uh, Amid, uh, Abidyan Medical Shop. Now Abidyan's grandchildren live in London, but nonetheless he, he has Hyderabad connection. So there's a quite dynamic people they have been on they have been a while. There's a strong Armenian diaspora in the United States. And they also play a key role in the sense they determine or they influence the, the policy that Armenian government pursues, foreign Paris policy as well as the domestic policy. Uh, This conflict, present conflict, erupted on 27th of September. There was a flurry of activity and they wanted, wanted to con contain the conflict and, and force them to negotiate and so on. Uh, in fact, one can trace out the history. Actually, a major conflict after small sm skirmishes broke out in 2000. Uh, in that conflict, 35,000 uh, men from both sides were killed and uh, a million people were displaced. Quite horrible, but uh, nonetheless, in 2014, Russia succeeded in brokering a peace. Despite peace, the tension continued and you see, Russia backed Armenia very strongly in the first war, and because of them, the Armenians could occupy 6% of Nagorno-Karabakh, which they extended over a period of time, and the whole of Nagorno-Karabakh came under their control. Uh, and this stalemate continued and uh, Azerbaijan was oil rich, which is oil rich and uh, which had moved closer to Turkey. Perhaps this also should be mentioned that from Turkey to Kyrgyzstan, all the people speak variations of Turkic language. If an announcement is made in Istanbul, then all of them can understand. Now here, Azerbaijanis are a Turkic people. The three Caucasian countries of Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. Georgia and uh, Armenia are Christian, and Azerbaijan is Shia Muslim country, which was parts of which were uh, Persian Empire, actually in the olden days and the, the funny part is the Armenians adopted a Persian king as their king in the past. So when the Soviet Union was established when these were created then began Armenia has always been colonized by the Mongols, by the Turks, by the Russians and, and, and so on but they struggled very hard to somehow maintain their independence. So when, when Soviet Union occupied Armenia, Armenia became part of the Soviet Union. In 1923, the, the borders were drawn and Stalin very arbitrarily gave Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan. 
mind you, I'm, I don't want to go deep into history. I, as you know, Stalin was a Georgian, and in Georgia had Menshevik regime. Lenin deputed him to settle the matter there, and instead he very brutally suppressed the Menshevik government. And Lenin declared in his testament that he should not be given any official position because he's very cold. Coming to uh, Armenia, Nagorno-Karabakh is actually uh, Armenian populated area. Majority, vast majority of Nagorno-Karabakh people are Armenians. Stalin very arbitrarily uh, gave Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan. And that became the bone of contention. It's not different from what happened in Belfort Declaration of 1917 or Kashmir being given to India or McMahon line which China never accepted. They are all colonial legacies we have to put up with. However unpleasant the results might be, we have to contend with all these for a long, long time. Found the very insoluble, intractable problems are created by this colonial past. And now Nagorno-Karabakh became a permanent bone of contention between Armenia and Azerbaijan. The population there wanted to join Armenia and they could not. Uh, this has continued actually. If you recall, Crimea was ceded to uh, Ukraine by Brezhnev quite fancifully. Like, and then now Russia has taken it back. It has called, caused a lot of bitterness between Russia and Ukraine and the West. The West and Ukraine did not like Russia annexing Crimea. Originally Crimea was. Actually the original people there are Crimean Tatars. Nobody mentions them. But this area is taken over. So these are colonial legacies with which the Armenians and Azerbaijanis are stacked. Now, uh, this uneasiness between Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, persisted. No solution was found. It was pigeonholed and finally it erupted in 1992, 1994, sorry, 2012, and then 2014, Russia broke the peace between two of them and Azerbaijanis uh, you know, kept lying low for, for Yeah, they can hear you. Huh? Muted. Uh -huh. Can you hear me? Huh? Yes, they can hear you. Huh. Okay, so Azerbaijan is actually made use of uh, something like they're saying that peacetime is a time for preparation of a war. They're preparing for a war. And they had money and resources <clears throat> because of Russian strong support to Armenia in the 2004 war, they uh, had to concede almost their defeat. Uh, but now with preparation and Turkey support, Turkey is strongly supporting them. All out support they have extended to you know, Azerbaijan. The support they have and better technology, better uh, uh, air warfare taking uh, possibilities and so on. They have done a maximum damage. Yesterday, for example, two days ago, 700 plus Armenians were killed. And in this conflict, I think about a thousand people have already died. So it's a very unfortunate situation and nothing could be done to solve this question. And then they, they, the, they are caught up between big powers and their politics also. For example, Russia, Russia's intervention in Syria led to Turkey downing one of the planes. Turkey is absolutely opposed to Assad. And then subsequently, Putin was very, very angry and Erdogan made a couple of visits to Moscow, sat with Putin and sorted, sorted the problem out. Uh, now they are 
better if not allies at least supportive of each other vis-a-vis -vis the united states and eastern europe uh, sorry european union uh, which are very suspicious of turkey because they think erdogan has announced that he would support muslims particularly downtrodden muslims and downtrodden muslim countries whenever they are in need they let them support which the european union interprets as revival of ottoman instincts so there is tension turkey right now is an odd man out in the nato alliance and uh, they're not quite getting along quite well with the european union or the united states and uh, putin being a cold warrior he still has inkling of zero sum game what is lost to united states should be gained for russia so they have now come closer to each other there Russia holds the key in the sense that these two republics are amenable to Russian influence. But the situation as it stands now shows that the passions have run too high and they are not listening to Moscow as before. Uh, anyway, so once um, Armenia and Turkey signed that agreement in 2009, uh, <clears throat> Armenia, which, which is landlocked, as I said, saw possibilities in opening up to Turkey and beyond Turkey to the world. Uh, of course, the uh, Georgians allow Armenians free access to their port, Black Sea port. You are aware that the Black Sea port for Georgia is a great advantage. When there was a face-off between Russia and Georgia for the question of Abkhazia, which I visited at the time, many, many years ago. Uh, then Georgia claimed Abkhazia for, it, for itself. Abkhazians did not like Georgians. Uh, they are called Gariachi people, these are hot people. Uh, Abkhazians had outside influence. So uh, Americans said that they would support Georgia against Russia. And they sent a lot of warships to Black Sea. And the whole area became volatile. And then Abkhazia was recognized as an independent country by Russia. Georgians, of course, were quite angry with that, but they couldn't do anything. But Georgia itself was in turmoil for a long time. Uh, so, as I said, the whole area is in a mess. It needs to be done. And now this recent conflict has further complicated the situation. Uh, Armenia has a smaller population of 31 million vis-a-vis -vis Azerbaijan, which has uh, uh, some 70... 90, 94 million uh, people. They are small countries with small populations, but territory, no, both of them don't want to leave an inch of territory. Internationally, Azerbaijan uh, claims Nagorno-Karabakh and internationally it is recognized. Internationally it is recognized that Nagorno-Karabakh is Armenian territory, oh, sorry, Azerbaijani territory. But majority of them are Armenians and the, it is controlled by the Armenians practically. So situation is very complicated. Now, Turkey has made very big noises in favor of Azerbaijanis. They said they support them to the hilt. Now, they're encouraging Syrians to go and fight there. And many of them have come to that area to fight. In fact, uh, one can expect mercenaries to fight this war also, besides the regular armies. The situation is getting very complicated. Today's papers say that they have met Russian ministers from Armenia and Azerbaijan. Both have met President Putin. Before that, the Americans have been making go chairs and so on. But the conflict is intractable uh, because both sides have passion, passion passionately involved that 
and these passions have allowed to uh, flourish since 1988. In 1988, the Nagorno-Karabakh parliament passed a resolution making itself part of Armenia. Now, other Bajanis could not take it, so they, they immediately reacted to that and the conflict began there. Now, here is a situation where, besides the two countries, the backers of these two countries are in conflict in varieties of, on varieties of issues. Turkey is involved. In fact, first of all, first of all uh, the way it began, a similar situation obtains now. Uh, for example, the, the countries involved are Turkey. Russia directly because Russia backs Armenia and Turkey backs Azerbaijan. European Union and the United States have been supporting Armenia on, on religious grounds and also vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. Now also they might do the same. And then if it spreads, it can spread over into Iran. Iran, as I said, has thousands of Armenians living there. Uh, either these diaspora, Iran, Armenian diaspora, can be called subversives. They will not be trusted by the local people. But incidentally, this diaspora is doing very well. Economically, they are doing very well in Iran and in elsewhere. Now, with agreement with Turkey, they thought that Turkey also would open up more to the Armenians and they, they can go abroad and so on. Uh, Armenia is not doing economically very well. In fact, in a survey recently conducted in Armenia, most of the Armenian young people said they would like to go to uh, any other country and leave Armenia. That has implications for patriotism and so on. Uh, why the agreement between Armenia and Turkey fell through was Armenia, following Russia, has a constitutional court, as in Russia. It has been dormant, but in Armenia, when the agreement was signed, there was opposition to the agreement. And the matter was sent by parliament to a constitutional court. Constitutional court said you two conditions have to be met before this agreement can be accepted. One is that it should conform to the constitution of Armenia. Uh, it, it really doesn't quite conform to it. Then secondly, the Ararat mountain incident should be called massacre. Turkey has resolutely fought against it all through. When the American Congress was debating the question, uh, once again, the passions flared up. And finally, the American Congress, despite all this, passed a resolution calling it massacre. 1.5 million Armenians were killed since India. And they were forced to march into Mount Ararat. Uh, and they have very bitter memories of people, like the Chechens, for example. In Caucasia, Chechen people uh, were in mass shifted to Kazakhstan. Stalin said they were spying for Germany, which was nonsense, but nonetheless they were shifted. And for many years they demanded that they should be allowed to go back. Then in 1989 they had strong demonstration. Earlier also demonstrations were held, but in 1989 they uh, carried out a demonstration in Moscow and they were allowed to return. And when they returned, they found that the land was gobbled up by North and South Ossetians. 
It was quite a tragic situation. Millions of people were displaced. Quite a large number of uh, Chechens were killed, traveling to Kazakhstan under Stalin. But they were forced to do it. Now the situation as it stands, a kind of this oil pipeline and gas pipeline Europe is concerned. Europe and the United States, their national sympathies are with Armenians, but they're not blatantly going for it, trying to work out a negotiated settlement of the question. Uh, Turkey is totally backing Azerbaijan. Russia has moderated its stand. Earlier it used to go all out in support of Armenia. Now they are playing a kind of balanced game. And you know this area is available for games. Great games were played in Afghanistan and Central Asia. And now Russia is taking a very cool look at it. Azerbaijan has oil and has outside connections, has money and so on. Whereas Armenian landlocked, Yeltsin had the support extended to you know, Armenians. Whereas Putin is more practical. He has, he is trying at least on the face of it to be equidistant from both Armenia and Azerbaijan. Ultimately, if the chips are down, they might support Armenia. And so would the United States and European Union. And against them would be Turkey, Iran. Iran has already, you, you know that their, their relations with the United States are not good. And uh, the American presence in Persian Gulf and uh, repeated uh, mention of Iran as a sponsor of terrorism and so on. Uh, America is, uh, uh, in fact, glad to see Iran cornered. So this could have ramifications. Surrounding countries are deeply involved with each other. And if something goes wrong, it can flare up. It, some experts have already said that it has a first world war like situation potential. That happens, God forbid, it would be a disaster. So the negotiated settlement could be the only sensible possible outcome of all this. Uh, there is kind of war readiness also. For example, when the agreement between Armenia and Turkey uh, fell through, Turkey got dissolution and they, they invited or not invited exactly, they started moving closer to Armenia. In the meantime, Azerbaijan also moved, was moving closer to Russia and the United States. So if this is prolonged, then such moves can take place. And Azerbaijanis have declared this time that they will go all out to regain their territory. They don't compromise on this. Turkey has declared its support to Azer Azerbaijan. And they said, we will settle this question question once and for all. But how would you settle it? The question is millions of people and their lives are involved and the situation has been allowed to persist for uh, say from 1991 or before that 1988 and under USSR also there was uneasiness. It did not lead to war but these, these two countries were very uneasy with each other. So uh, how can you possibly solve a question uh, as complex as Nagorno-Karabakh uh, Yeah. 
so we have territory problem of territory nagorno karabakh is located in azerbaijan populated by uh, armenians there is this diaspora of armenians which are strongly opposed strongly opposed to any agreement particularly the diaspora of the united states they don't want any agreement with, with turkey and that agreement signed in uh, to, uh, 2009 has fallen through and uh, countries concerned have become uh, very disillusioned that any negotiated settlement is possible so as you can see diaspora iran uh, russia turkey eu and the united states their interests are very seriously involved if something goes wrong there can be a major conflict in the area which might extend to other corners of the world also possible now what holds um, the future prospects for what can you expect in future one can guess of two three four things the first thing that comes to mind is that is it possible to gain that territory by moving the armenians to go to armenia very difficult question very difficult possibility perhaps not practicable millions of people have already been displaced in the in the past and now many millions are going to be pushed out if that happens secondly nagorno karabakh is now semi independent completely controlled by the armenians now can we declare nagorno karabakh as a sovereign independent state if that can be done perhaps situation can hold but that is also very tricky question perhaps russia would not agree to it and and also and and azerbaijan also would not like nagorno karabakh being declared taken out of it and declared independent state the second possibility also is extremely complex third status quo being restored prior to 1988 which would mean the tension should perennially exist there should always be there that is also immediately not possible then turkey instead of meddling in this affair should settle its problems with Ar armenia separately that can possibly be done but the other three possibilities are extremely hard to to accomplish so in the meantime since negotiations have failed for 28 years and uh, the fresh mechanism like for example minsk group which was formed uh, after 1912 uh, 2012 i keep on keep on saying 19 to 2012 uh now minsk group of which united states turkey russia and france were a part they couldn't do much so even if negotiations are held under un auspices or through third parties including russia the very facile and easy solution is very hard to come by they have to make very serious compromises both armenia and azerbaijan have to make serious compromises uh, if any settlement is to be made and how stable that settlement would be how long lasting peace between these two countries would be is, is anybody's guess so i hope the situation is very explosive and let's also hope that through uh, negotiations or russia is no longer in, in a position to impose its will on the area it's no longer soviet union they are now independent countries used to their independence from 1991 so positions are hardened on all sides azerbaijan this time is in a better position because they have money they have weapons and so on they are scoring points and battlefield also they are more effective than before 
So why should they leave their advantage and make concessions to Armenia? Armenia has now declared that they are willing to talk, they are willing to negotiate a settlement. Uh, but it appears the problem is intractable unless serious compromises are made. Thank you very much for your for your time, and uh, I'm expecting hard questions from you so that I give more explanations and more facts may come to my mind and, and share with you. Thank you, sir, for that enlightening lecture. We have not only learned about the history and reasons behind the conflict, but also have benefited from your analysis and insights on Nagorno-Karabakh. And your personal anecdotes have made this lecture memorable. And I would like to thank you once again for taking time out from your busy schedule. Now, there are a few questions that the participants would like to ask. I will read them out one by one, and you can answer them if that is fine by you, sir. Please go ahead. So the first question is by Dr. Om Prakash Upadhyay. He is asking if there is any chance of world war if US and Russia take active part in this conflict. Radical and so-called nationalist power, nationalistic powers also can play part in this conflict that lead to world war. Yes, as I said, potential exists. But will the situation worsen to such an extent? that they have to directly intervene, I still, uh, I think we are still uh, far off from that time. Some more time is there with us and we should make best use of uh, this time and the United Nations should play a more active role in this. Russia and the United States these days, with Trump around, is a great admirer of Putin and Putin is an admirer of Trump. Uh, I think they would not like to involve themselves into a world war on behalf of a tiny countries like Armenia and Azerbaijan. Much greater interests are uh, involved in this. When there was no war, when Crimea was taken over by Russia, there was a little uh, war in the sense localized war. War was localized. Uh, but there was no overall conflict. So they are varied. They know the consequences of the larger flare-up of war. Uh, but yes, possibility exists if that happens and they both take opposite sides. Uh, in Syria, for example, Americans had to put up with Russian intervention. Now, they, they support two different uh, sides, but conflict is nonetheless unless uh, Western interests are very direly affected. They are not going to involve them in such conflicts, right? In case of Georgia, also, see when Russia Georgia fought a war in 2008, there was a possible, there was this talk of America intervening directly on behalf of Georgia. They sent some ships to Black Sea. Beyond that, nothing happened. Abkhazia was immediately declared by Russia as independent and Georgia's claims were denied. So possibility or say potential exists, but I don't think this is going to happen uh, for sure. Uh, today, there seems to be no more questions, sir. Usually we have around 10 questions, but I urge the participants to please share the questions if they have any or even queries. So we have a new question from Dr. Sanjit Kumar Shil Sharma. He is asking, "What is Turkey's ambition in all, in all this conflict?" See, Turkey's direct, immediate concern was that genocide level should be taken off because they were accused of genocide in 1915, and this was causing problems to them. Uh, and they wanted this removed from the uh, uh, from this particularly American mind. 
so they wanted that and secondly they wanted nagorno karabakh question solved in both both the fronts on both the fronts progress is nil because americans have already passed the resolution declaring 1915 uh, ararat incident as genocide and azerbaijan has gone is repeating his support to uh, azerbaijan but uh, americans or russians have not responded very seriously to that so there's another question by narendra kumar jarwal he wants to know uh, how, uh, how do you think russia intends to proceed in the conflict russia as i said has taken a nuanced balanced stand on, on the issue they want to broker a peace they as as right now today it is reported that ministers from azerbaijan and armenia have gone to meet putin they want to offer their services to resolve the issue but have not taken sides strongly in the last war say in uh, uh, 2012 Uh, they they have taken armenian side and other azerbaijanis had to give up because big boss refused to cooperate with them this time uh, they have taken a very balanced view they have not involved themselves passionately on religious grounds with armenia so russia wants this settled they don't want this to spread further Iran is quite concerned about this. It might spill over to Iran. It's, it's possible, and you know they are uh, Azerbaijanis are also Shia Muslims, more closer to Iran. So Russian ambitions and Russian calculations have to be uh, very cautious. So there's a question by Evangeline. He wants to know why do you think there is such a deep impact from this conflict on the international system, despite them being such small vicinities, small countries, is what she means to say. I think one big reason is oil, oil supply from Baku. The pipeline goes via uh, near uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, westward. So if there is a conflict, and oil supplies or gas supplies are affected, and given the volatility of prices at the international level. it could cause quite a serious damage so therefore the west is alarmed they are not interested in either azerbaijan or armenia per se neither neither are they concerned about the human damage and the like they are looking at their own interests interests are regular supply of oil and gas from baku uh, and uh, therefore they think if the conflict persists if it engulfs other countries then the oil supply will be seriously damaged uh sumaira sharma wants to ask you sir in your opinion should some complex issues be handled from international law perspective would that be an approach now international law has been made nonsense of by both the sides they have bombarded civilian population civilian centers and In, in one attack, some 32 sleeping um, Azerbaijanis were killed. So, international law, first of all, is not enforceable. Even if something is done according to the provisions of international law, then both the countries, as sovereign countries, would refuse to abide by it. So many other countries have done it before. So they have precedents. so on the basis of international law perhaps international court of justice or some other arbit uh, agency which can arbitrate between the two countries can do a good positive job but right now such agencies are not forthcoming the doctor om prakash upadhyay has another question He is asking whether is it true that Turkey is seriously to become the leader of Islamic countries, and it seems that it is a change and right it, it, the atmosphere is right now very favorable to, or is it favorable for for such a turn? 
this is not a viable thing to think about Turkey because Israel and the West are quite alarmed. The only people who had international presence and ruled and dominated international scene were Muslims. And after 1918, Khilafat gone and so on, uh, they have fear that they might come up. Israel uh, speaks of Khilafat off and on. And, uh, and Turkey is being accused of nurturing uh, neo Ottoman tendencies. They want to become the leader of the Muslim world and so on. These are far fetched ideas uh, based on the fears of the West. Or at least they want to make it, uh, take it as a they stick to beat with Turkey. Turkey is in no position to uh, have such a leading position, making noises on behalf of uh, a few countries or individuals doesn't make them leaders. The Muslim world of 56 countries is too varied. And as, as you have seen, organization of Islamic states, quarrel amongst themselves quite often. And now Israel has split them all further by signing agreements with uh, Abu Dhabi. And, and now reports are the Sudan has erupted in protest against this possible agreement with Israel. So it's more Israeli based than anything serious to be taken uh, internationally. Turkey can never hope to become a leader again, at least in the near future. Okay, so Rajesh Kumar has another question. Hmm. He wants to know whether the conflict between Russia and Turkey on the Syrian land has hmm. spilled onto the episode at Nagorno-Karabakh. And will it have future implications for the region surrounding the area? How can that conflict influence uh, Nagorno-Karabakh? I don't Russia see the connection. And Turkey's relations, I think he wants to know, will have uh, impact because it is in Syria and Nagorno-Karabakh, how their relationship will be affecting or? Even in case of Syria, now Putin and Erdogan are friends. They are talking to each other. And Erdogan has made two visits to Moscow already. And Putin, when the Russian plane was uh, shot down by Turkey forces in Syria, of course, there was much hue and cry. And, but they passed up after these visit, visits. So uh, one more thing that all of you as a scholar should keep in mind is that very little information, real information reaches us. Behind the scenes, situation is quite different. So now Putin and Trump are admirers of each other. And uh, Putin has Cold War instincts because he cannot still reconcile himself to the loss of super power status of, of USSR, Russia. Uh, he, in that sentiment, he makes certain moves. A smaller sentiment than any, anything real. They are uh, clever enough, intelligent enough to understand this is, the world has moved on. Situations have changed. So, first of all, I don't see much of a connection between Nagorno-Karabakh and Syrian war. As to Turkey and uh, uh, Russia, Russia. They have already patched up and they are getting along fairly well. And Turkey is an odd man out in NATO. Turkey uh, is having quite an easy relationship with EU and, and the United States. And that Putin sees as, a, as, a, as an advantage for Russia. Okay, sir. This is, uh, this is our last question. Uh -huh. Narendra Kumar wants to know what is India's stand on this conflict, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. India has not been coming out with very clear reactions to uh, many things actually, not just Nagorno-Karabakh. So we we do not know, but seeing BJP instincts, 
they might support our media. Raw instincts of BJP and their overall way of looking at things, they might have soft corner for Armenia, but they have not spoken about it. Okay, sir, thank you. I think this, this wraps up our question answer session. I now request Rajesh Kumar, Assistant Professor at the Department of English School of Language, Literature and Society from Jaipur National University, give the vote of thanks. Over to you, Rajesh. Thank you, Riva. Um, I'm sure uh, you will all agree when I say it was a true honor to hear Professor Mozam speak. His lucid arguments, his enthusiastic delivery, and his command over the topic, as well as the depth of his knowledge, were inspiring. Added to this, it was a genuine pleasure to have such an enthusiastic participation for, for, from the audience. I thank the president of AIRS, Ariba Asnath, for conceptualizing, realizing, and bringing to fruition this inaugural lecture. I would, I would also like to thank Professor Mosum for taking time out of his busy schedule to join us and give us this enlightening lecture. I thank all the members who have worked tirelessly to make this event possible, making special mention of uh, Jaiba Tamkanat, uh, Narendra Kumar Jawal, Mohamed Farisuddin, Salma Jahan, and Sayo Mulya. We at AIRS are grateful for the support, enthusiasm, and determination of the speaker, participants, and the team at AIRS. Under the unfailing guidance of our president, Ariba Asnath Mozam, this event was made possible with these closing statements. I call this uh, event to an end. I thank all the participants for joining us. Thank you all. Thank Over you. to you, Ariba. Yeah, thank you, Rajesh, for succinctly giving us the vote of thanks. I want to once again thank all of you for joining us today and making this event a success. Have a great day ahead, and I hope to see all of you at our first distinguished e-lecture by Venezuelan Ambassador Alfredo Toro Hardy on his latest book, China versus United States, Who Will Prevail? This is on 31st October. Thank you so much. Have a great day ahead. Bye-bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for joining us.